Hi guys, it is one blustery, windy day here in the end times in paradise in East Bumblefuck, New Mexico. 50 mile an hour winds blowing outside today, so me and the little dog are taking refuge here on this blustery Tuesday morning, February 28th, 2017. We have made it to the end of another month. So Tuesday is always a lot of fun here. This is when I dive into the mainstream media science pages to see what the various wacky mad scientist, techno-utopians, conspiracy wackos, and anti-scientists, and all the rest of the various flotsam and jetsam of the human race are up to in the wacky world of science. So uh, I'm gonna set the little dog aside and dive right into this story, which I was going to put into my Saturday clueless moron roundup rant, but I found it on the science page. And the more I think about this story, I, you know, I could do an entire rant. This is pretty much gets to the very core of Humpty Dumpty tribe right here on the science page is the, the absolute no shit Sherlock story of the week. <clears throat> Want to know the future? Most people don't study suggest. No shit Sherlock. <clears throat> Despite the popularity of horoscopes, most people don't really want to know the future. A new study from Europe suggests that is particularly true if future events are negative. Huh, do you think so? <clears throat> the research which surveyed more than 2,000 adults in Germany and Spain found that 85 to 90 percent of participants said they would not want to know about certain future negative events in their lives. And just 1% of the participants always said they wanted to know what the future held. And, and guys, just so you understand this, that this has nothing to do with the collapse of a planet the the collapse of society and all of this stuff. This is looking at stuff. Do you want to know when you're going to die? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just this real personal me, me, me stuff. But you better goddamn believe uh, that you can extrapolate this, this research that people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And I love this quote uh, from study author Gerd Giger, Gigerenzer of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. Quote, In Greek mythology, Cassandra had the power to foresee the future, but she was cursed. And so no one believed her prophecies. Huh. In, in our study, we have found that people would rather decline the powers that made Cassandra famous in an effort to forego the suffering that knowing the future may cause. Yes, uh... Let's see. The only exception to the rule was whether people wanted to know the sex of their unborn child. There you go. The researchers hypothesized that people choose, quote, deliberate ignorance because they anticipate that they will regret knowing the answer of, of what's going to happen in the future. Huh. 
Do you think so? By choosing not to know about the future, people can avoid these negative feelings of regret that they predict will come with having learned about future undesirable events. Researchers, the research has also found that people who usually choose deliberate ignorance were more likely to avoid risks. Ha, huh, do you think so? <clears throat> the researchers noted they don't know whether the results would generalize to other events not addressed in the study such as the collapse of global industrial civilization and the collapse of a planet and their own children being cast into a burning lake of fire. Still, the research has said their study shows, quote, that deliberate ignorance exists and it is a widespread state of mind. Yes, do you think that deliberate, igno deliberate ignorance is a widespread, widespread state of mind? The uh, full study will be published in the March issue of the journal Psychological Review. There you go. Uh, anybody who doesn't understand why deliberate ignorance is uh, one of the main reasons uh, let the mainstream media spell it out for you. You know, it, it really has to take some work to be so to be such a goddamn deliberate clueless fucking moron on this planet. Okay, let's go over to uh, the apocalyptimist side of the fence here. Many versions of this story this week. I love the New York Post showing up on the science pages. The New York Post, you know, one step above the National Enquirer. <clears throat> In case of apocalypse, <coughs> Arctic Doomsday Vault can regrow world's food supply. <laughs> Humanity's life insurance policy just got upgraded. The Svalbard Global Seed, seed Vault popularly known as the Doomsday Vault, uh, has received a new intake of 50,000 seeds from all over the world. That is going to save us from, you know, global food insecurity. Uh-huh. The new batch of 50,000 seeds is one of the largest single deposit deposits made in the vault since it was built in 2008. Um, okay. Heralding the event, Maureen Haga, executive director of the Crop Trust, said, <clears throat> Today's seed deposit at Svalbard support supported by the Crop Trust shows that despite political and economic differences in other areas, collective efforts to conserve crop diversity and, a, and produce a global food supply for tomorrow continues to be strong. Oops, wrong button. We got to, uh, and now speaking of not knowing which button to push on this, it, this is just one of these never-ending arguments 
uh, where you can uh, go from one side to another. <clears throat> this is one scientist's new theory that religion was key to humans' social evolution. There you go. So, uh, both no shit Sherlock and bullshit. All right. <clears throat> In humans' mysterious journey to become intelligent, <clears throat> socializing creatures like no other in the animal world, one innovation has played an essential role, religion. That is the theory that a preeminent evolutionary scientist is setting out to prove. This is Robin Dunbar, evolutionary science, preeminent evolutionary scientist. Quote, you need something quite literally, to stop everybody from killing everybody else out of just crossness. Somehow, it is clear that religions, all of these doctrinal religions, create the sense that we are all one family. Yes, uh, I hate to break break the news to this preeminent uh, evolutionary scientist, uh, Dr. Dunbar. Uh, he, he might want to take a look at how, how many years, 10,000 years of historical precedent, how organized religion how organized religion has uh, brought together this planet as one big happy family and has kept us all from killing each other. Now, of course, you know, I'm being a little hard on Dr. Dunbar. What he's talking about is inside these organized religions that how these clueless fucking morons, no matter which god uh, of their choice, the god du jour, is that they use that as a major uh, glue to glomming together with other clueless fucking morons so they can go out and kill all of the other clueless morons from the other religions. Anyway, okay, uh, we're looking at some of the big questions here on Humpty Dumpty Tribe today. What is going on with the perhaps the single biggest whack job techno utopians of the pack? Would be, of course, the uh, transhumanist. They want to be literally. Machines, says writer Mark O'Connell on the rise of the transhumanist. And this is from this website, which I like, called The, the Verge, interviewing uh, writer Mark O'Connell uh, with his, coming out with his book, comes out today, To Be a Machine. To be a machine, this nonfiction book delves into the world of transhumanists or people who want to transcend the limits of the human body using technology. They want to be cyborgs and they want to solve the problem of death, whether by freezing their bodies through cryonics or uploading their consciousness into machines. Yes, and so they do a, uh, a long Q&A with this guy. Uh, so, ask, and so how exactly do you define transhumanism? So according to this fellow, for me, it is someone who thinks, it is someone who thinks 
that we should incorporate technology into ourselves to use technological evolution to push forward the evolution of the human animal. These people want to not be human in a very sort of radical and thorough way. They want to be literally machines. Uh, I really like... Uh, Okay, I like this question. What were some of the transhumanist ideas that seemed the strangest to you? <clears throat> Take it away, Mark. When I started to look at what the basic ideas were around transhumanism, the thing that I found most alienating and weird and completely speculative was the idea of becoming disembodied and uploading your brain, you know, in, into a computer. It's called whole brain emulation. It is the end point of a lot of transhumanist thought. But then I met Randall Kane, who runs Carbon Copies, a foundation that supports research on whole brain emulation. I find him incredibly charismatic. I was really struck by the tension between what seems to be the complete insanity of what he was saying to me, the madness of the idea that he might be able to eventually convert the human mind into code and talking to this normal, really smart guy who was explaining really clearly his ideas and making them seem, if not imminently achievable, quite sensible. I was quite swayed by him in a weird way. D, 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 D. Anyway, very interesting. Uh, this goes on and on. I should probably add this book to my list of uh, <clears throat> Bibles of the Apocalypse. Okay, from the transhumanist to the do-it-yourself gene editors. Do-it-yourself gene editing. Fast, cheap, and worrisome. This is from the Wall Street Journal. The CRISPR technique lets amateurs enter a world that has been the exclusive domain of scientists. I don't have time to uh, get into a, a whole rant about the CRISPR technique, mainly because I have no clue what the fucking CRISPR technique is. Yes, uh, but it's just the latest, the CRISPR uh, revolution is just the latest scientific breakthrough raising big ethical questions. Yes. Uh, some scientists say that the power to alter the very DNA of plants, animals, or people, and the profound impact such changes may have on individuals and society merits public discussion. In CRISPR gene editing by amateurs and hobbyists brings an unusual set of challenges. CRISPR is easier, faster, and cheaper than previous gene editing techniques. Yes, while that raises the prospect of people with nefarious intent gaining access, the greater concern with amateur enthusiasts is that someone might make a seemingly innocuous gene edit in, say, a fungus, insect, or plant that turns out to wreak havoc 
on the environment. Yes, uh, this is Maxwell Melman, a professor of law and bioethics at Case Western Reserve University. Quote, the question is, can we rely on individuals to conduct their experiments in an ethical and appropriately safe way? The jury is out. CRISPR is too new. We have to wait and see. Yep, I don't think we're going to have to wait long before we see. Okay, let's stick with some of the big questions facing the human race uh, here in the 21st century. The never-ending debate, the latest chapter of this from LiveScience.com, are humans inherently selfish? And of course, this is uh, leading off with our selfish uh, egotistical uh, egomaniac in, in chief, Donald Trump. Donald Trump uh, setting off this debate, uh, the most selfish motherfucker we have had in the White House in history. Uh, <clears throat> okay, at the heart of any conflict of interest situation is the question of whether to act in your own best interest or to do what is best for the greater good. Trump's issues might make a cynic shrug. After all, don't we all look out only for ourselves? Psychological research suggests the opposite, that self-interest is far from people's primary motivation. In fact, humans are prone to act for the good of the group. Many studies have found. This is uh, Samuel Bowles, an economist at the Santa Fe Institute and author of The Moral Economy. <clears throat> Quote, in the past 20 years, we have discovered that people all around the world are a lot more moral and a lot less selfish than economists and evolutionary biologists have previously assumed, and that our moral commitments are surprisingly similar to reciprocity fairness in helping people in need, even if acting on these motives can be personally costly for a person. You know, this is a long, long, in-depth story. Again, I mean, any one of these stories today, guys, I could go off uh, on an hour-long rant, easily, to just reading this. You know, it just goes through a quick history of this age-old debate, this, which will never end. Uh, you know, it alludes to the tragedy of the commons, uh, if you're aware of Garrett Hardin's uh, views on this, about, uh, yeah, uh, about how... how people are going to act in the best interest of the group. Now, of course, from an eco-Nazi perspective, which of course is never mentioned in this story because the eco-Nazi perspective never is, I will agree that <clears throat> if, if you do find instances where people are acting for the common good, well, uh, for 99.9% .9 of those rare, rare jewels, they are acting for the common good of humanity, which 99 out of 100 times is bad for the common good of every single species of planet we, sh of earthling we share this planet with. So, 
from the eco-Nazi perspective, whether or not people are selfish or not, that this is always the bottom line of the eco-Nazi perspective. But anyway, guys, as I say, I could I do a, a, a full round on any of these stories uh, <laughs> to, to shift gears just a little bit <clears throat> from Huffington Post, many versions of this story. This is Huff Post spin on it. Humans now watch a billion hours of YouTube every single day. <clears throat> Congratulations, world. We have now collectively reached the milestone of being able to say that we watch a billion hours of YouTube between us every single day. And just think, your mom said you would never amount to anything. The proof that mankind is destined to fail and that we all need desperately a new hobby was announced in an official YouTube blog on Monday. <clears throat> Quoting the blog, let's put that in perspective. If you were to sit down, sit and watch a billion hours of YouTube, it would take you over 100,000 years to watch one day of YouTube. Now guys, uh, I have said many times that I honestly believe to this minute that if there is any chance at this point of saving this planet, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, and just, just like anywhere else, a, a, a tiny, tiny percentage of, uh, I would say, probably one-tenth of one percent of YouTube, there's some damn good information on it. But, of course, the 99.9 percent .9 of this billion hours <coughs> of day uh, of YouTube watching is being watched by a bunch of clueless fucking morons who do not want to hear the future. Anyway, because they have to get back to the cute cat videos. Okay. Let's see, this is just kind of a hodgepodge here towards the end of my rant. Take a wild guess. What is the single biggest cause of sparking wildfires? Sparking wildfire all over the planet. Well, I guess they really centered on the U.S., although you can extrapolate to the rest of the planet. What sparked 84% of wildfires in the United States, and my guess is 94% of the wildfires on the planet last year. If your guess was lightning, you are a clueless fucking moron. Can you say humans, humans spark most wildfires? People smart, sparked most U.S. wildfires in recent decades, causing longer fire seasons and increasing the amount of scorched earth, according to a new study published Monday. <clears throat> Researchers found that humans caused 84%, more than four out of five, of the total one and a half million wildfires studied between 1992 and 2012. Lightning accounted for the rest. So we have human activity versus Mother Nature. Yes, 
Uh, in addition, humans tripled the length of the fire season during those two decades and were responsible for 44% of the total acreage burned. Now, I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, humans are expanding fires into more locations and environmental conditions than lightning is able to reach and the potential threat is expected to get worse. Places where houses are intermingled with natural areas are expected to double by the year 2030. Here we go. Now this, this damn story is, would take about, it, it is a book from the science desk at Business Insider, a forgotten war technology could safely power Earth for millions of years. You know, we could power this Earth for millions of years and go right on about our business. If we could just figure out how to power ourselves, there's no reason that humans cannot just go on about our business for millions of years. Okay. And this is just the, the summation of it. Uh, the lifeblood of modern civilization is affordable, free-flowing energy. Humanity may face, may face an energy crisis as the world's population rapidly grows. And take a wild guess how we're going to do this. Nuclear power plants can generate bountiful, carbon-free electricity, but their solid fuel is problematic and aging reactors are being shut down. But coming to the rescue is, and uh, this book-long article from these goddamn techno-utopians is thorium. Thorium to the, to the rescue. A Cold War era liquid fueled reactor design could transform thorium, a radioactive waste from mining, into a practically limitless energy source. Yes, and companies and governments are now trying to revive and evolve the design, but development cost, regulations, and nuclear weapons concerns all pose hurdles to saving the planet through thorium. Okay, two more here, and see if you can connect the dots between these uh, this is a video, so uh, all I have is just the one sentence <coughs> description. Worldwide UFO sightings hit all-time high. According to data from the National UFO Reporting Center, UFO sightings around the world have reached an all-time high and statistics show individuals in the United States are more likely to witness a UFO. I think, if I recall from the video, people in the United States are 300 more times likely to witness a UFO than the rest of the planet. See if you can draw any dots between that article and this one to wrap up this week's <clears throat> wacky science report. AT&T tests drones to bolster cell reception. Any, any dots 
between U record UFO sightings in the United States and the explosion of these goddamn drones flying all over the United States and more and more on the rest of the planet. <clears throat> okay, AT&T may use flying drones to improve cell reception. AT&T calls the devices flying cows, flying cows of cells on wings. The, the program help the program may help the carrier improve poor reception, which disappoints customers in some parts of the country. They actually mention New Mexico. Here in East Bumblefuck, there is no cell phone reception here in East Bumblefuck, New Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> After months of work, the company performed its initial test flight outside Atlanta this week. The massive drone started up, took off and hovered for a bit, and then landed. Uh, according to AT&T, a single one of these flying cell towers can provide coverage for 40 square miles, and since it is tethered, this flying cell phone tower is tethered to a vehicle-based ground station. It is continuously powered and never needs to land to be recharged. Oh, God. Flying cell towers. How long will it be before us here in East Bumblefuck, New Mexico can look up and cheer on the flying cell phone towers coming to an East Bumblefuck area near you. But of course, if this son of a bitch came through today, it would be blown out of the air. But anyway, the little dog and I are going to head out into the windy wasteland of East Bumblefuck to see uh, if my uh, turnip greens have been uprooted in the gathering shitstorm brewing on this planet. I will be back at you tomorrow on March 1st with my climate change meltdown roundup rant for this roundup. Bye guys.